Welcome everybody to another 10th edition preview. Hot off the press, a Games Workshop has released an article on the Warhammer community site about squad leaders. So these are going to be your characters, and apparently they're changing quite a bit. So I'm going to break down this article and then give you my thoughts as a competitive player, what I think about them, how this is going to change the game, and whether I'm excited about them or not. So if you're a fan of this type of content, if you've been enjoying some of the other previews like the Lion preview yesterday, go ahead and leave a comment. Let us know what you think of this type of content, as well as give us a like, tell your friends about us, subscribe to the channel. All of it massively helps. And if you want more in-depth content, um, like coaching matches, all those stream games we put on, put on three a week in the War Room, as well as tons of other video streams, go ahead and click the link below, thewarroom.vhx.tv, and there's a three-day free trial. Check it out. Um, you know, you're going to really enjoy a lot of the stuff in there. All right, let's head into this article. Leaders now join squads to personally deliver powerful boons in the new Warhammer 40,000. Hopefully it's not the boon of change from Chaos. Do not, I cannot abide by the Chaos. The new edition of Warhammer 40k is bringing some massive changes to the rules. One of the most eye-catching is the way that characters now interact with their subordinates. Powerful aura bonuses that they used to impart on all nearby troops are gone in almost all cases. Aura abilities gone? Wow. Well, frankly, uh, 9th edition started with um, some pretty tame auras overall. Honestly, the Silent King was the one that stood out with full rerolls to hit and shooting, full rerolls to wound in combat as, wow, that's, that's a really good character buff. Uh, but for the most part, they started introducing more command phase targeting single units, or maybe you can target two different units with the same ability like my will be done from Necrons, but aura abilities can be ludicrously powerful. If the effect is too strong, the finial from Guard right now, uh, you just have a bunch of, whether core units or uh, whatever it benefits, having some ludicrous bonus while being within six inches. The problem with auras in 9th edition 40k is that they were never wholly within for the most part. They were just within six inches, which meant a single model is within six inches of that character, the unit is strung out all over the place into the middle of the table, you would still get the aura bonus. So unlike Age of Sigmar, where you have to be wholly within range of auras to benefit from them, 48k you could string out units all over the place and still get all of your auras. And uh, that honestly meant that if they were too strong, everything in your army was getting it, and it was easy to get. There was no real you know, uh, strategy to making sure that you got access to these. For the most part, it was simply automatic. Um, so those units might as well have had this rule on their data sheets, uh, frankly. So I'm glad that they're changing aura abilities. I think either most auras were either they don't really do too much. Um, the generic plus one leadership aura, great warlord trait. Uh, although Necrons, do, it is the best Necron warlord trait. And then you, on the other hand, had ones like the Finial that are just ludicrously powerful. Um, they tried to temper them a bit by restricting them to core. But as we've seen throughout the edition, core has not been evenly balanced from codex to codex. So I'm glad that auras are going to be uh, much rarer. And I hope that the ones that do exist um, require units to be wholly within a certain range um, so that they're actually acting as a unit. All right. So now, rather than handing out rerolls to anyone, and I believe in the previous article they mentioned that rerolls are going to be much rarer, Although Space Marines with their Oath of Moment are going to have that rerolls to hit, rerolls to wound on a particular target, uh, thanks to their army wide rule. Rerolls were also obscene. Almost everything was rerolling everything reroll hits, reroll wounds. Then, there were, then they had to create rules that were you can't reroll any hits, you can't reroll any wounds. It resulted in a, a lot of feels bad because either you get your rules and it's amazing and everything hits and wounds and your opponent takes a thousand saves and insta kills units. Or on the other hand, you don't get any of your cool rules that you paid a lot of points and characters for, and your opponent just turns them off. So um, I'm hoping rerolls are much rarer, and the ones that are popular, like reroll ones to hit, totally fine uh, to have that. But the full rerolls to hit, the full rerolls to wound, it just got way, way, way too excessive. All right, so now your heroes can join a single squad and act as one cohesive unit. Ooh. This is, uh, this is some old school 40k. Characters joining units. It's an elegant system that helps keep overbuffed super units at bay. Uh, that remains to be seen. <laughs> that might be a little ambitious, Games Workshop. <laughs> super units is one of your specialties. Uh, Primaris Lieutenant, here's a little example. He has, his core is leader, whatever that means. Uh, obviously, he's going to be some sort of special character, but uh, core apparently is still going to exist in some fashion or another. 
action, Oath of Moment, so I guess that's simply their trait. And then Tactical Precision, while this model is leading a unit, weapons equipped by models in that unit have the Lethal Hits ability. Uh, that is either, is that Six's Auto Wound? I forget from the other article uh, which, which one that specifically is. But not bad, it used to be real ones to wound. Having, you know, having your unit get benefited with, I, I guess, Six's to, six's to Hit Auto Wound, not bad. Obviously, it's the unit that you're joining, so this character is directly only buffing a single unit, which means the characters that have the stronger buffs are probably going to be the ones that are actually taken. Whether this is going to be strong enough in the context of the Space Marine characters, no idea, but it seems okay. Um, really depends, like, if you can fit this guy into a Terminator unit of 10 models, then, then it's worth it. But fitting him into, you know, five Intercessors, probably not going to try and do that, so... It'll depend on which uh, units these characters can actually join. Target priority. This model's unit is eligible to shoot and declare a charge in the turn in which it fell back. That's an amazing rule, and straight up I already want a Primaris Lieutenant. Having no uh, knowledge of what the addition is going to bring, that in 40k is a very, very strong rule, because it's not simply fall back and shoot, but also charge as well. You know how powerful that is on the Crisis Commander giving it to Crisis Suits. And once again, it's going to favor units that are larger, so that more models actually benefit from this role. But that is very powerful, and I honestly think the Primaris Lieutenant way more powerful, uh, apparently in 10th edition, than it was in 9th. Wow, some, some pretty pretty solid rules here. Obviously, it depends on how big squads are going to be. Uh, take this Primaris Lieutenant. First thing you notice is the leader ability, which unlocks the ability to join a squad. Okay, so there it is. If you're core leader, you can join squads. This is done to, before deployment. Um, it's done before deployment. Okay. It's interesting, interesting. So not in the middle of the game, I guess. At the same time as transports are allocated, units are placed in reserve, the leader becomes a permanent member of that unit for the whole battle. All right, so there's no shenanigans with, I send this one 10-man Terminator unit out with the lieutenant inside, Terminator unit gets beat up, and then the lieutenant leaves and joins a different full-strain squad and buffs it the same way. So you're... We'll see how defensive mechanics work, but if you can stack a lot of defensive buffs on a unit, and it's also on the larger squad size, that's where a buff like this, where you're actually going to realistically get it for multiple turns, is going to be very powerful. Each leader has a short selection of units that they can join, all of them listed on their data sheet. All right, so here, there's some restrictions. All right, so as long as Games Workshop keep up this level of restrictions, uh, throughout uh, the various Codex releases, I think we'll all be in a very happy place, um, unlike Necrons at the beginning of 9th edition. Primaris Lieutenant can shack up with... Shack up. Interesting phrasing. Uh, the editor uh, is getting a little loose there. Shack up with Intercessors or Blade Guard veterans, but leaves Gravis, Armored, Aggressors, and Heavy Intercessors to his more appropriately equipped colleagues, which I guess is the Gravis Captain, uh, can join those. Okay, so only Intercessors or Blade Guard. Six blade guard, if you can still run them in a six man. Not not a bad rule to have, although fall back and shoot really doesn't matter on them. Maybe if intercessors keep the double shoot and you run a ten man squad, not a bad rule to have target priority on. But we'll have to we'll have to see. Obviously, uh, this model can be attached to the following units: assault intercessors, blade guard, hell blast. Okay, hell blasters. Hell blasters will benefit a lot from this. Redacted, redacted. I guess those are Marines are getting uh, more new, new units. Uh, intercessor squad. All right, so doesn't say veteran intercessors, which means that um, kind of data sheet might disappear, although it's really never ever taken anyway. But Hellblasters probably stand out the most as being able to fall back and shoot. That's a great rule to have, uh, especially if Marines can't get it in any other way. Blade Guard being able to fall back and charge. Their shooting is pretty mediocre, but fall back and charge, still a great rule to have. Uh, so, not bad here. And maybe if Assault interces Intercessors keep the double fight, that's where being able to fall back, charge, and then fight uh, twice at some point could be very powerful. Just, just potential combos here, not bad. You can attach this model to one of the above units, even if one Captain or Chapter Master model has already been attached to it. Alright, so it's possible to add multiple characters to the same unit. And if you do, and that Bodyguard unit is destroyed, the leader units attached to it become separate units with their original starting Brains. Okay, so uh, that you don't get, so what they're preventing, I guess, is just having a character unit. You lose the unit of intercessors, and then the chapter master and the lieutenant 
aren't going to count as a unit together. They're going to go back to their starting strength of individual models. All right, makes sense. They, they did think of that. Um, <laughs> trying to stack a bunch of characters. But having two, the fact that you can get two in there, a chapter master and the lieutenant, I don't know what the chapter master does, but um, having two characters buff the same big unit could be powerful. Uh, we will have to see. But 10 Hellblasters with those buffs? All right, maybe, maybe they're really trying to make Hellblasters work. His tactical precision ability grants his subordinate lethal hits, a core ability that makes critical hits, which is the term for unmodified sixes to hit, or sixes to hit auto wound. I was correct. Wow. Most of the time, only one leader can join each unit, but as you see, the lieutenant is an exception, which means that probably other factions are going to have exceptions as well, certainly Eldar will, and can join the same squad as a superior captain. All right. Fluffy there, obviously, captain hanging out with his lieutenant. Uh, plenty of factions have similar low rank support leaders from the Biophagia Surgeons to Warlock Battles. See, I knew Eldar would get an exception. The old lookout sir rule has been devolved into this new system. Your leader is kept safe by their bodyguards and can usually be targe targeted only when everyone else in the squad has breathed their last. Wow, that's, that's a sad thought. The last Marine to die. Uh, but okay, it's, it's going to be, seems to be the main way to protect your characters now. Um, and if that is true, then most characters are going to be joining units. They're going to, it's going to be tricky, because um, if you try and use that unit then as a trade piece, you're probably giving up the unit as well as the character, and that might not be worth the trade. So maybe you're going to have like a couple buff units with characters inside, and then as much cheap nonsense as possible. Um, we'll have to see. It will be interesting to see how it plays out. But sniping is definitely going to be more powerful in that case. I imagine sniping will let you shoot at the characters inside, uh, but we'll have to see. Not all characters possess the leader ability. Oof. Oof. We'll see. <laughs> However, independent sorts may instead have the lone operative ability, which means they can't be targeted by ranged attacks unless the attacker is within 12. Okay, that's a, that's a fair rule. I imagine, once again, snipers should probably ignore this. Um, this potent defensive trait is common among the stealthier specialists, of the 41st Millennium, such as the Vindicare Assassin, or Com Commander Shadow Sun. All right. Uh, so she will have a similar rule as she does now. Um, so if you're within 12 of her, you should be able to shoot her. I think that's that's uh, that's a good rule. I wish they had more of that in 9th edition, honestly. A lot of the crazy defensive mechanics, um, like Harlequin, um, their, their boats, uh, their Star Weavers, if their defensive mechanic turned off when you were there within 12 of them, the Mirror Architect didn't exist because it breaks the fundamental rules of the game, that's that's fair. That's a fair trade-off. Within 12 means you're actually having to being forced to sacrifice something, and that's exactly what this game should be about, uh, making tough decisions in, in trades. So uh, some characters only gain the lone operative ability when taking shelter near an appropriate unit, such as when Iron Father Pharos is working on an allied vehicle, or Lionel Johnson is near a unit of Adeptus Astartes Infantry. Such heroes tend to benefit their comrades without leading them, perhaps through aura abilities that boost nearby allies. Makes perfect sense to me. Commander Sato's son, look at that. All this talk of defensive boons highlights one of the core aims of the new edition, making hardy units feel appropriately tough on the battlefields. Great. Um, as long as it is not ludicrously defensive, and as long as the rest of the game doesn't get amped up in damage over the course of the edition, like 9th edition, I think this will be a fantastic change. If we go back to the damage levels of early 9th edition and keep that consistent throughout 10th uh, as a whole, I think the game will just be in a much more fun, interesting place because you get to play out a game. Not everything you put out into the center of the board instantly dies, uh, regard almost regardless of whatever faction you're playing. Sorry, Death Guard and a couple other armies. Uh, this is most evident with vehicles, so if you want to see what sort of punishment your, your tanks and skimmers can take, check back later in the week as we dig through the biggest changes to everybody's favorite big metal boxes of mayhem. I'm excited to see what they do to vehicles. I think they kind of, towards the end of editions, just started jamming tons of extra wounds onto vehicles or extra defensive stats, like plus giving them better armor saves, minus one damage, uh, etc. So it'll be interesting... Do they go with the same approach here and make vehicles dramatically tougher uh, than infantry units uh, while scaling down damage? Or are they actually going to try and keep them their typical profiles, um, but just be accept that they're toning down damage overall? Which I don't know if they are. I hope they are. Um, but we'll end up seeing. All right. That looks to be the end of their new 40K article. Pretty 
like, he's, like I said, I think 9th edition just got off the rails with way too much damage too quickly, um, especially once we hit that Drukhari ad mech onwards uh, trend. The first part of the edition, I think the damage was relatively appropriate. Dark Angels came out and had best-in-class defensive stats, but they still didn't run over everybody. Uh, there were a couple armies that had a hard time into that, and they probably could have toned it to baby transhuman or only transhuman, um, you know, if you're more than 12 inches away or some, some change like that uh, to make it not so, quite so powerful. Um, but it looks like they're very careful with these buffs. There's a lot of extra limitations on them, so you're not just getting every single rule in the world on all the key units that you want. You're going to have to pick and choose and make some tough choices. And I think this game needs more tough choices in list design instead of the auto choices that we have in 9th edition. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to everything that I've seen so far. Let me know what you think about these changes in the comments below. Like I said, give us a like, uh, tell your friends about the channel, as well as please subscribe to the channel. All of it massively helps. And if you want more in-depth uh, Warhammer content, especially as 10th edition uh, is on the horizon, uh, once we get that edition, we're going to be pumping tons and tons of content, tons of stream games, uh, trying to make the best possible lists. And if you're eager for that, check out the War Room, thewarroom.vhx.tv. There's a three-day free trial, and uh, it's in the description, a link below. Thank you so much, everybody, and we'll see you for more 10th edition hype videos in the future. So long for now.